um, so yeah, hopefully we'll have some chance for discussion and questions at the end. Um, our original title was Protect the Cheerleader, Protect the World, um, which maybe that's why you showed up here and we're actually not talking about cheerleaders, but <laughs> Daniel will say why he chose that title and then I will say why I um, made it a subtitle instead. So Daniel, how did you come up with this amazing title? So yes, we're from Davidson College, and Davidson was in the March Madness last year, and so we help basically all students and Cheer they want to cheer leaders. I know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we're actually the Q and A, so apologies for the wrong. Oh, and the Q and A I think is the next. It's the next session. The next session. That's what yeah, it is. Okay, thank you. Uh, so yeah, so we're at Davidson College and. The, during the March Madness, I noticed that a couple of the starters on our basketball team had domains. So I had this idea that we could start like a March Madness for the schools that had domains and try to figure out like who had, which starters had, you know, more starters had the dom more domains and blah, 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 blah. So there was that. And also, I, I love a good, um, I also love a good mashup. So if you've seen Heroes, then you know, save the cheerleader, save the world. So I kind of mashed those two together. But it didn't really work out because not a lot of the schools that are part of March Madness have domains. Yeah, there were only like three in the whole tournament, and so. some of them weren't full fledged <coughs> domain <coughs> projects. And blah, 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 so maybe next time, maybe next year. So, what instead this turned into, which is more of kind of looking at our domains project that's been going on for five years and kind of looking at it from different perspectives. So, none of us here have been at David, well, Brian, sorry. You have been at Davidson College for the five years, but not, none of us have been part of the Domains Project for all five years. So we came in later. So we're kind of offering our different perspectives as we came in and from our different roles. Up here I have Domain of One Zone because we realized that we kept saying Domain of One Zone, Domain of One Zone, Domain of One Zone to everybody, right? And literally when we put it up as words, someone came up to me and was like, I've been thinking that you've been saying domain of one zone for all this time. And so we're like, that, that makes sense. <laughs> so we're domain of one zone, um, five years in. Um, so this is us. We've already kind of introduced ourselves and we've given ourselves titles or names for this presentation that are about our kind of role in domain of one zone. Um, so I'll start out with me, and then I will let others um, explain their titles. But uh, I lead the instructional design team at Davidson. I've been there two years. Um, and so my job with Domains is really connecting it to things that are happening on campus, initiatives, student groups, things that I hear about, and really trying to figure out um, that people know about it and where we can um, possibly use it for different initiatives that people already care about. So that's kind of my role. Um, Brian, would you like to talk about being Mine's not self-explanatory, I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, I do back-end work, make sure the software that we rely on runs, look for ways that we can improve functionality, functionality and usability for our students. Daniel is, oh, he changed it back, okay. He's been changing his. <laughs> <laughs> I am space, so. Um, I do after Sunday kind of coordinates or connects faculty members who want to do these types of digital projects or whatever. I uh, consult with them and try to get them to either do something big in their classroom or in their course or smaller with domains. So I go in and do workshops or I send emails. I answer a lot of the uh, tickets and uh, stuff about those kinds of projects. I originally had PH in there, so but I didn't think face <laughs> PH made sense. Sorry. So I'm Adele. I am the instructional design intern, and so I'm the reason because I hope to share the student experience um, using domains, at least from my perspective, in what I've observed. And Adele is a upcoming junior. So. Five years ago, these were our goals. And I would say like we have similar goals, but it's good to look at your goals five years later and be like, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong, right? Um, so the Domains Initiative at Davidson has been grant funded for five years. 
which is awesome. That means we have faculty members who they care about it and they've helped get funding for it. Um, I'll talk about how we go on from now later. Um, but it is, uh, our initiative is that all students and faculty get their own domain and they can do whatever they want with their domain. So we don't give out subdomains, we give out domains and hope that they take it with them. Um, both faculty and staff actually. It's been interesting working with faculty who move to a different school and you can actually say like, no, all those class sites that you actually created, they're yours. You can take them with you. You don't have to be like, oh, in that Moodle from a long time ago. <laughs> um, so here they are. Uh, I don't know, are these similar to your possible goals in domains? Um, I'm not going to read them. I'll let you take a few minutes. A bit lofty, I think, sometimes but they're a good way to um, continue to look forward. So we might come back to these, but in 2017, we decided to do a student survey to see whether or not these goals were actually being communicated to our student body. Um, and I begged others to do this with me. Actually, at the last domains, I said, hey, I'm doing a research project. Who wants to be part of this? It's okay. Okay. People have lots, <laughs> lots is happening. Um, I'm not looking at anyone in particular. They're sitting next to each other. <laughs> um, but anyway, we worked with Tanya Justin, who's part of DITA, and she does research, um, like cross-institutional research on online learning and digital tools and, and different um, student experience stuff happening at the university and college level. And so she helped us create this survey that was based on our goals and just figuring out what we wanted to find out from students. And we sent it out to um, a little over 700 students and I think we got like a 25% uh, response rate, which is actually really good. Um, we of course offered gift cards, 10 winning gift cards. Um, but it was good because we got some information back on how students were actually perceiving domains. I'm not going to share with you all the questions. It was actually quite long. It was a qualitative sort of approach. Um, but some of the main things were, um, of course, over 80% were motivated by a class requirement or a project assignment to create their domains. I think that's probably pretty common. Um, People usually don't do things unless they're prompted to do it for something else or getting something. Although we have a few outliers like rando student who created an app using his domain that had nothing to do with a course, but I think those are usually outliers. Um, of the responders who said they continued, 25% said they continued to use it for class projects, 13% for personal, and 11% for professional. I don't really know what they mean by that, but interesting. Um, for those who reported that they did not continue, they saw that they didn't see a reason for keeping it or they forgot about it. That's a huge one actually, which Brian will discuss <coughs> later on from the technical aspect. And then almost 60% of respondents said that they didn't know anything about Davidson Domains when signing up. So I think what this showed us was there's some stuff happening, great, but there's a lot of work to do in terms of communicating what this is, um, what people can do with it, and what it can be outside of a classroom, which I think is a lot of the goal of um, domains initiatives. Also, one quote. <laughs> oh, no. uh, it's adorable. You think I have time for anything personal? I think this was in response to the question, like, do you use it outside of class? Um, but they did have an idea of if they did have time, that they would use it um, to... Uh, address plot holes in different popular books, probably a WordPress site. So I love the idea that they had an actual idea for a website, even though it wasn't um, one that they could actually do. So, kind of fun. The other thing that came out of this was that students didn't really know what it was, like they weren't connecting that it was a domain of one's own, that this was a space for them to really kind of develop and take their time at Davidson and kind of add to it and, and use it as a workspace. And so we worked with we did a focus group of students. We had a student leading this initiative where we kind of tried to rebrand and really think about terms that might connect with students more. So we came up with this think, own, create. 
Um, and then we kind of wrote out text there. The students wrote it out to kind of explain what they thought that this um, could be and how it could connect to students. So we went from really, we're saying that this is a domains project. When you go to domains, it was like Davidson. Main building of Davidson. Yeah, yeah, do this for whatever you want. No, this is Davidson, right? So we really wanted to change it and get it away from it being so institutional based. And so this is what we came up with. Um, we haven't had any feedback about whether or not it's working. So. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to talk about is lately we've had some really great potential larger things get, that can happen on our campus that we're excited about connecting with for domains. So um, I'm guessing that this might be similar for a lot of your efforts, but there are the faculty members who like love using it, gave up the LMS a long time ago, and like are just going, and they have 30 billion sites. Um, and so they will just continue using it, and that's great. And then we get a few more people who use it for different things here and there, or who want to use it more for class, and that just continues to grow. Um, we have two departments that require it for their students, so there's a class um, in the major, so English major, one class, 220, um, literary analysis, of course, requires to have a domain and create a portfolio. And so I think we see um, that as a, a positive and a negative thing in terms of how students get introduced to domains. So we have faculty members in our English department that love it and do it with their whole heart. And then we have some that don't really do it themselves and have somebody else do it, come in and kind of do it for them. And so that really creates a disconnect for students. So we're figuring out how to kind of do that. But instead of connecting maybe to departments, we're thinking more of connecting to different initiatives on campus. So one of our big things is this kind of catalyst high impact learning initiative. So basically, um, there's a group on campus who have identified the experiences that they consider high impact or experiential learning. And we, it's kind of a messaging out to students that every student, it would be great if they had one of these experiences. And one of the things that makes it a high impact experiential learning experience is a reflection piece. And so domains is of course a great place for students to really use, um, to create a reflection that maybe others can see, maybe others can't see, but um, it really lends itself to that. And so we're really trying to work with that group to make sure that domains is where people kind of think first, to kind of go and, and have those reflections all be in one space in some ways so that people can find them, right? Um, and that kind of sense making can happen uh, across student experiences. And then we also have a, an HHMI grant that's happening around inclusive pedagogy in STEM. And so um, we're trying to connect with them and figure out, you know, how, how does domains um, create a space for more inclusive pedagogy? Does it, right? Um, and so that's another big initiative. And then up here, I probably don't have any OU people here because they have a presentation at the same time, right? But uh, the brainchild of Keegan Webfest is a, um, I think it's a four-day faculty workshop where you really dive into kind of what Chris was saying, the, the hood of technology, so the hood of the internet, um, and really, figure out what is the internet and what is a domain, and then go from there. And so we're gonna actually, we did it once with faculty at Davidson, um, and it worked really well, it was a tiny group. Um, but we really want to do it with students now. I think we're figuring out that students really need that, that really diving in deep um, to where maybe they don't think they wanna be, and then going back up and seeing it from a bigger picture um, perspective. So we'll probably start with our media consultants who are our student employees and see how that happens. Adele, Adele is one of them, so she will be part of this initiative. So those are our potential. Um, and then our problem of funding. So five years again, grant funding, it's been awesome. Um, but now we kind of have to take this under our belt as a software right, uh, purchase. Um, and so I think we're open to that and I think five years there's no way that they're going to yank that out of Davidson like people would riot in the streets which is awesome right 
Um, and so we do have some time to like work it into our budget and figure out. But at the same time, that really changes how things work and how you answer to what we're doing with this. And so we'll see if there are any changes as we switch from being totally grant funded to being funded by, by the academic software budget. And that's my spiel. So a couple of years ago, I took over the tech support back-end stuff that we do. And unfortunately, the person or people who were responsible for that aspect of the program before me were no longer there. So I had a lot of catching up to do. Um, this is the kind of thing that, as Domain of One's Own continues to grow and goes on for longer and longer, it's going to become a problem. The people who run the tech are going to go on to other jobs or leave the college or whatever. And you're going to need to pick up uh, where somebody else left off. There is no one-size-fits-all template for doing this. Uh, these are just a few things that I ran into. And my to-do list is pretty much never-ending. <laughs> So the first thing we need to do is clean up, getting rid of dead and dormant accounts. Um, we had about a little, it was a little less than half as many actual active accounts as we thought we did. Because in five years, nobody had ever purged, graduated uh, student accounts, faculty who moved on or whatever. So what we were reporting to management really wasn't terribly accurate. Um, because those accounts, <coughs> WordPress, uh, weren't being updated, there was a security risk. Uh, so I got together with our dev, dev team and did came up with a tool that makes it a little easier. Uh, we queried WHM, WHM and WHMCS for lists of accounts and emails. We compare those to our Active Directory and find out uh, which of those are no longer associated with active college email addresses. Um, compile a list and throw it in Dropbox. And then the unfun part is that somebody, me, uh, has to go through regular intervals and uh, check that list. There are a couple of, couple of people who have left the college, but we still have their accounts active and domain of one's own because they were the umbrella for a lot of other small projects. We haven't figured a way to effectively get rid of them yet, and they have to be manually removed from the list every time we do this. Otherwise, we get a repeat of the first time we did it, and their sites get shut down, and you start getting lots of calls from organizations going, my website is no longer there. Uh, we deactivate the accounts in WHM, actually delete them from WHMCS, and reclaim is kind enough to process a, an archive and uh, zip an archive for us. Uh, where they compress all the directories and throw them off to our archival storage, not on our server. And then they maintain that for about a year. So, how many of you actually have sunset procedures for your student accounts? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. All right. So, we're not alone there. Um, ideally, in an ideal world, they get the, those accounts remain active for 30 days past graduation. We do a zip and archive and we retain that data for a year before we delete it. And I actually have had some students come back six, eight, nine months later and say, hey, can I still get my domains back? And it was nice to be able to give that to them. But the other thing we're really careful about is in our communication, we don't tell them that. We lie. <laughs> in 30 days, your account's gone. That also covers, if it covers us if there's an accident and one doesn't get stored. So does it work? Uh, we've only gone through it the one time, but so far it seems to work. We'll go through it for this year's graduates here in about two weeks. <laughs> so the other thing I found was a lot, a lot of students were heavily into Wix, Weebly, whatever site builder you want to name. Uh, Squarespace, yes. Um, and a lot of them had come to it you know, on their own or they had a particular exposure was you know, they're a member of a student group who needed to set up a website, and we don't have a protocol for that at Davidson yet. Uh, it's being written now. 
And somebody in the organization had found Wix, we believe, Squarespace and set up an organizational website and so the students knew about it and said, hey, this will be cool to use too. Well, it's free and it's easy and it's pretty. And so how do you argue against that? Well, we're free too. <laughs> um, hopefully that's not us. <laughs> um, so how do we make that argument? First of all, we are, we'll, we'll hold your hand. Uh, even our students, our student media um, consultants are very able to help with domains questions. And we are, we really, at Davidson have for years put a lot of emphasis on that one-to-one -one connection. And as I realize at a small school that's easy to do. But to the extent that you can sell yourself as a service-focused organization, students are going to get a benefit there versus the site builders who just basically take your email and never answer it. Um, we listen. So if Adele comes to me and says, I have this idea that will make Davidson Domains 100% better, chances are if she's right, it'll get implemented. Um, just is not going to happen with a big commercial site. Obviously, ownership and portability. Uh, Sunday earlier mentioned faculty taking their data with them. Um, if you've ever tried, if you've ever had a student ask you, hey, I want to pull my data out of Squarespace and replicate it here, the answer is good luck. <laughs> Build it again. Um, we try and emphasize to them that this, that their that their data is portable. And not only that, you know, particularly for like art students, if they're putting up a gallery or a portfolio, they don't lose ownership of that data when they put it up on a, on a domain of one's own site. And we try and be as helpful with uh, licensing commonly used software. The biggest example is we found uh, we've gone through Studio Press and Organic for themes. We've licensed more than 100 and rolled those into the default WordPress installer, so they come ready to go with a ton of really attractive templates and you know whatever you want to do with your domain you can do it and as long as it doesn't involve like threatening the president mm -hmm. finally how many ever how many people ever got hired because they could build a weebly site <laughs> <laughs> This is probably the meat of this section. What do we do about WordPress? Uh, great platform, security holes uh, up one side and down the other. Uh, the first thing we did was we customized our WordPress installer package so it automatically takes all updates. The only thing I would say about this, this is a, this is a great thing to do except when major updates roll down. When the 5.0 update rolled out, our server ground to a halt. It was theoretically still running but it was taking so long to answer page service requests that it was registering with our monitor is down. Um, Reclaim was really good about getting that worked out for us and for whenever they release six, we'll probably figure some way to do a staged rollout, but just be aware that that can happen. My CIO gets US CERT security alerts and started coming to me going, there are all these WordPress holes and WordPress plugin holes and how do we deal with this? Uh, the responses were kind of arbitrary. Well, these are not rated very highly, they're not rated at very high risk, so we won't worry about them. These are high risk, but we did email everybody last month and told them to update then, and if we email them again this month, it'll get to the point where they just ignore what we're sending them. So, uh, yeah, and we had no idea who had what plugins installed. There was just no way to know. So what we did was we built a gadget that scans for plugins and reports back in a user-friendly interface uh, what we've got installed. Gives us a friendly, automatable, although it's not completely automated yet, uh, proportional response to security alerts. And by proportional, I mean with every security alert that comes down, we're able to email the four users of this version of this plugin and say, you have a moderate security risk on your site, please update. We don't have to email everybody for those four users and go, hey, update right now. So I'll kind of walk you through the process quickly. And if anybody wants to talk about this afterwards, uh, we can do that. 
and also I'm trying to talk my coworker who wrote all this stuff into open sourcing it. Um, so <laughs> we have a shell script on the server that trolls every single WordPress installation and looks in the plugins directory for each installation of WordPress and gets a list of the subdirectories in there, which should correspond to a list of the plugin names. In doing this, one of the things to point out is that we really benefit from the fact that WordPress has fairly stringent requirements for how you label these things. There's a file in every WordPress plugin folder that has the version number and the name of the plugin, and by searching for those, we can parse that out. Um, JD understands regular expressions. I do not, so please don't ask me to explain that. Actually, if you go to regex101.com, there's a great builder slash checker that'll help you put that stuff together automatically. So that script then calls another shell script that uh, adds some additional data and outputs, spits the whole thing out as a CSV. And this is the file I was telling you about. It's a PHP file that has the plugin name and the version. And the versioning is really important because a lot of times the alerts that come down will say plugin versions X through Y, but the plugin is actually already at version Z. So again, it gives us that scalable, customizable response where we can say, okay, 15 people have this plugin installed, but of those 15, 10 already have the version that's got the plugin, got the the the, uh, the bug fixed. We move everything into Snap Logic. Grab the uh, CSV file off the domain server, doing that by SFTP. Uh, parse that for snap logic. We group each line in the CSV by home folder, which enables us to know which, which users have which plugins installed. Uh, do a little bit of field remixing. I wish I could be more specific about what the remixing involves, but that was exactly the language I got from JD. So once again, non-coder, I don't really know. <coughs> Uh, meanwhile, we have a second uh, child pipeline that's running through SnapLogic to talk to WHM and get a full list of accounts. And this is what the SnapLogic setup looks like. Merge the two. There we go. Do what? Okay. So again, our, our end goal here is to know which users have which plugins. The final JSON document comes out looking something like, I should not have done that by paragraph. <laughs> uh, looks like that, only a lot longer. And that goes to Power BI. Uh, if you just control, yeah, it's back there. Where is it? Oh, back obviously. And it looks like this. So we know how many total plugin installations we have, how many total different plugins we have, how many domains they're spread over, and how many individual users have those uh, plugins going. We can look at records, but it's really not very readable. Sorry about that. I, my one request to Pete Benbo, our Power BI guy, has been, can I please adjust the size of the fonts in my hands? <laughs> um, but here we have records by plugin. So the Akismet AP Spam scanner is installed 900 and some times, which makes sense because that's one of the default plugins that gets installed. Everybody has that. Uh, down here we have the organic widgets. 25 people have that installed. That's associated with some of our themes. Um, we can look at records by user, so we can see who our users are who really use a lot of plugins, and that's uh, Doug Meyer, Mark Sample, Suzanne Churchill, Fuji Lozada, and Jim Murphy, who all have multiple sites under their one umbrella. Um, we can look at what domains have the most plugins installed, although that's really not that useful for what we're doing. Uh, what's handiest is I can search this, this list by email address, domain, or plug-in name and see who's got what running. And this is where I can pop my list. This is also, let's see, where did the presentation go? Somebody where is it? Uh, do, sh should have. Once again, should have taken a screenshot. 
So are we there yet? What we have left to do is the same thing we do every night. <laughs> so we want to automate the account reading. Right now that's a high touch process. We want to try and get it to where we can feed it a CSV file and have it automatically go into WHM and WHMCS, make the modifications it needs to, and automatically spit an email over to reclaim or alternatively go ahead and do the zip and archive itself. Um, when we get security alerts, the end goal for this process is a, an interface that lets us say, okay, these plugins have security alerts, these users have them, send them this boilerplate email that says to update. Again, we, we're not going to be able to get it to zero touch, but the, the object is to remove as much of the touch as we can. Um, we're looking for a set of accessibility focused themes. Davidson is really on an accessibility kick with their website right now for a lot of reasons, and we're trying to uh, get students into that as well. Um, we're gonna this this is actually going to happen here in about in about two weeks. We're going to switch to HTTPS as our default for everything, including existing accounts. So are we there yet? Uh, no, because there is a moving target, but we are making a lot of progress and trying to get more flexible, more secure, and more usable in that process. That's it for me. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to try to do... <laughs> I like this, you know, the Z, sorry. From okay, the I mean, is he can spell, he just chooses not to. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I've been in, again, uh, two years now as an instructional designer at Davidson College. Uh, our domains piece, what we're trying to do is make it our anchor technology. So it is at the heart of pretty much all of the work that I do. And when I go into a classroom, one of the first things I talk about is how to frame the relevancy of the domain of one's own project. So um, the story, I will uh, tr tell a very quick version of this. 13-ish years ago, I was living in the Czech Republic and I was becoming uh, an instructional designer or I was hoping to get work as an instructional designer in another country. So I thought the first thing I need to do is take ownership and figure out what is out there under my name. So if you were to even now Google Daniel Linz on one of your internet thingies, uh, this was back in the day, this was the most popular picture of which there were 10 or 15 because this is Daniel Linz. This Daniel Linz, however, 13-ish uh, years ago, was caught for cocaine uh, trafficking and illegal possession of firearms and that kind of stuff. So I was fighting with his, my digital doppelganger. And it took me all of the internets to take that back. So once I realized this was happening, I just started getting on all the channels and making things that would have my name on it somehow. I didn't understand how that would work, but I thought eventually I would win. So for four or five years, everything was cool. Uh, this Daniel Lins went down the, the, the list of pictures and other things that popped up, and my domain popped up, and all these other things that I've done, my Twitters, my Vines, all these things. Um, so this picture got pushed away, but then it happened again, where when this Daniel Linz got out of jail in Florida, the first thing, well, I don't know about the first thing, but the first weekend, <laughs> first weekend he was free, um, he has now been um, put in jail again for murder. So he got out that weekend and, you know, he, he killed someone. Um, so what I try to do with the students, they find this comical because they Google themselves all the time and they kind of, they know what digital presence is out there with a similar name to theirs, but I try to tell them, like, you know, you really want to make sure that you control your agency, your identity, and your dexterity. And I don't think there's a better way out there to do that uh, than um, uh, class slash personal projects with domains. I mean, there are many ways, but I think uh, uh, something that's free that you get to play around with a lot, um, that's the thing. So what that means is I will be called into, I'm not going to uh, go into these links. We will share this whole deck out later. So if you're taking screenshots or whatever, we will remove stuff that we're not allowed to share and then we'll send it out, something like that. Um, these are um, projects. So as I mentioned um, in the intro, I go into a class, I do workshops, or I, and I try to bring media consultants with me, 
And then what we do is, and this might be something some of you do, and I think we might have based it off of someone's work maybe, uh, where we take a class and we say, Adele is going to take over History 163, and she's going to do all the mapping things for this class. So we assign media consultants she's to... She's going to do it, is she? Huh? She's going to do it all? Well, she actually already, she did it last semester. She is responsible for that class. So students in that class know Adele as the media consultant who will help with her domain. They can also go to the library Sunday to Thursday, 8 to 11 p.m., and get support from the media consultants who are in our Studio D room, and they can just do drop-in hours, or they can reach directly out to our media consultants, which this past semester has helped tremendously. <laughs> it's just been so helpful because you know, usually we get inundated with tickets directly to me. If I'm the face and I show up into a classroom and they go, hey, it's Daniel. Okay, I'll write Daniel with that question. Well, I go into, uh, I think in the fall last year, I went into 25, 26 classes. So multiply that by 10 or 15 and I have 300 students writing me emails saying, hey, Daniel, can you help me fix this theme? And I'm like, no, I don't have the time for that. <laughs> Please find someone else. So what we've tried to do is kind of scatter the support a little bit so we make sure that Adele has the skills that she needs and obviously we get media consultants who have different interests and stuff like that so we try to balance their interests with the support stuff. So Adele is an art major, yeah. yes, and so when, when there's an art class this coming semester we will probably push whatever domains projects come to her unless there are too many and then we'll divide it up some. Uh, so that's basically what this was meant to uh, summate. Why are the fish up here? Anyways. Um, all of our, um, there, we have a, th we are now in the third year moving into our fourth of a campus-wide symposium uh, that was originally called the Alenda Lux and it has been renamed to the Verna Miller Case Symposium for Undergraduate Works in Creative Research. That's a long acronym, but it is actually just now the hashtag VMC Symposium, so you can check that out later if you want. Basically, that's where so many domains projects end up. And so for that, um, I or we support the VMC, the Verna Miller case uh, committee doing things and building a website to showcase and portfolio the work, but we also do tons of work in the back end um, helping students get their projects and portfolios ready for that one day. It's only one day and it's insane and it's amazing because that's why we're there is to see the student work and see how awesome the stuff they do are. And speaking of the students, we had uh, Humes 103-104, which is basically a year-long class, a 100-level course, like an introductory course, where um, we managed to actually recruit four media consultants this year. So we're going to have, uh, we have five, I think, rising, five rising sophomores. So we're going to have these media consultants for three years. That's another good thing, is to get them in their first or second year so that you don't have to retrain people every year. And they're awesome to just hang out with and do work with too. Um, but anyways, I'm not going to read these things, but you, these, this was some of the feedback that came from that humanities class. So these students, after a full year of using domains in two semesters for different types of their portfolios and whatever else, this was the feedback they had about uh, kind of comparing uh, their Moodle experience to their domains experience. Yay. Adele, are you ready? I am. Cool. Adele. All right, so I'd like to share my perspective of the student experience. Um, so it's my second year in, and I've had the opportunity to take classes, uh, like at least three classes in which we've used domains. And I wanted to start off with how they're fantastic, and then I'll get into why I think they fall short on some things. But um, they're really great for sharing work rather than submitting to Moodle, and I think students in general prefer a domain website for or catered towards the class instead of having Moodle as one solid platform that's similar. Um, and then we've also been assigned weekly preliminary posts for discussions. Um, we've got portfolios that we do at the end of the semester. Um, and then, in general, using domains is great for enhancing our digital literacy among students and also um, their design skills using WordPress. Um, and so why do students generally prefer domains? They find it more comfortable and more representative of the courses they're taking. 
And so with that being said, there's also some confusion. Um, the first thing a student would think about when hearing domains is what is a domain? <laughs> then what's a subdomain? Um, and then how do I make a subdomain? And Davidson does have directions and media consultants to help them, but um, this is the source of their confusion. And then other than that, how, how do I organize data um, is another learning curve. And so this is the top of my humanities portfolio. It's a year long um, course for freshmen. And so it's basically just a cumulative project that we share at the Synopsium that Daniel just talked about. Um, and yeah. However, so when the discussion is done with that, it's graded, and then it's a dead end. It's not really used anymore um, by the students I've encountered. And then this is my digital art portfolio that is also a cumulative um, display of work that we did. Some of it was shown at an exhibition for students, and then we also reflected and presented on it. It was graded, and then there was also a dead end. It wasn't really used anymore. And next, this is my last class in which I used domains, um, critical web design. And so this was one of our first assignments. We learned how to use HTML and CSS. But um, we sort of shared this and then moved on to doing a service project. And then that was the end of that. And finally, this is my art portfolio. So this is when I realized I could be using domains for my own good um, in my own art practice and sharing my work. Um, however, I never realized why I could be using my main domain, what would I be putting on my main domain, and this is where the disconnects happen. No one really knows what to use with their main domain. Um, instead, I have a bunch of subdomains, which is not an issue, but um, as students entering the workforce, I think it's really important for us to find our interests um, and figure out our digital presence and then put that onto our main domain. Um, so that's going to be my initiative as a media consultant. Um, and I, I hope to let students know that you don't have to be a comp sci major to digitally promote yourself. Um, and by using our main domain, I hope to make the ultimate resume, um, just sort of clarifying my work, myself, and my interests. And so going forward, um, I hope to work with Sundy and Daniel and Brian to have domain workshops um, that more clearly, you know, uh, lay out domains and how we should use them, take a more comprehensive approach to looking at them, um, and then just prompt students to think critically about their digital presence outside of social media. So my next. My next objective, personally, will be to revamp my domain and have every have bits from my portfolio on there, have uh, my service work on there, what I'm doing with my internship, um, just keep it up to date and in flux for my career. So thank you. got a question you were talking about the, the moving of groups and such between accounts um, and, uh, and then a question comment we we this has been a problem for years and years somebody comes in oh we can do a site with Weebly let's you know, join the domain at Weebly and then they go away and it doesn't get updated and then you know somebody else comes in oh I want to make a site now and um, have you tried using the move product? Because with, with and we're, again, we're, we're like working into, we're in year one, mm -hmm. year zero to one. Um, and, and because of that, for certain accounts, not necessarily students, but for staff accounts where they might manage, say, four departmental websites, we've tried using, and it effectively creates a second cPanel account, which shows up as a product under WHMCS, 
and then you can move that to another WHMCS account. Have you made have use not. of that? No. And it, just, just I haven't had a need for it. Okay. Well, I thought that was one place where we were thinking that that might be an actual, like, a good use of that. I suspect those those domains that were listed at the top of the plugins count, Doug Miner, Fuji Lozada, I suspect that as we develop solutions for the sites that are hosted under those accounts, that's probably what will wind up going to get moved or something similar. And you, you sort of laughed when I was like, took my hand down because you said, because you added students to that. We, we sort of talked about some of the exit processes for staff and faculty, but not so much for students. Well, it's easy when they take over their account, right? Yeah. Um, That's the best. And the funny thing is when they don't and they're just still in there, they, they can't go into cPanel because it's part of SSO. Right. But they can actually just log into their WordPress site right now too, right? Yes. And we actually had a, a former staff member who was still using. <laughs> and Brian was like, oh, how interesting. <laughs> He's been here. gone for two years. Why? <laughs> <laughs> um, if you have access to WHM, you can also give them the cPanel direct login and uh, change their uh, password for them there. And that lets them not just into their WordPress sites, but the whole cPanel after graduation. So that's a something we do by request, and those are my favorite requests too. So. Oh yes, yes. Well, uh, well, that's the ones where we have a group of people we want to be able to access the cPanel portion of this, and so you have to figure out. You can't. They're like, oh, but they need more access than just WordPress plugin, you know, WordPress administrator. They, and then you can have one person be like the main contact for the website, and then. You can give them the cPanel, the WHM uh, login, and then they can disseminate that as needed. But if, then, of course, there's the security issues of. And cPanel doesn't handle multi user very well. Yeah. Or at all. In fact. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Thanks for your presentation. Um, so with the symposium, that's the time when people come together to show off their domains projects, is what I'm understanding. Is there like a digital space that throughout the year um, showcases some of these projects so you can check in, or is it more of a sharing in person once the projects and the domains are sort of built out? Working on it. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So yet another one of those things where um, we finally have, we've been I'm sure folks went to um, Tom Woodward's presentation. I didn't get to go to it, but he's helped us create, and I know Tim's working, you guys are doing this at Muhlenberg too, uh, creating kind of a, a site that um, grabs all other sites and showcases them. So we created a plugin that people can opt into so that there's an opt-in, opt-out, so that then when you opt-in, you can say, uh, this is a student site, this is a, an experiment, this is for this class and it will show up like that in the menu of this community site. Okay. So we're trying to use that and then put an actual discussion board on that as well so that people can actually talk to each other about the projects. So hopefully next domains will have that to show. Okay. Yes, yeah, so, uh, this is very interesting for me because I, I, uh, I work in the area of web archiving and so the question of, of, of uh, I think some setting sites or what to do when people are no longer interested in having them be hosted. Um, and so uh, web recorder, you're my guy right now. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm curious, kind of, yeah, well, uh, both from a hosting perspective and a student perspective, would would uh, kind of, would students be interested in taking their site, for example, and having an offline copy of it for their own records if that was possible, or possibly transferring somewhere else? And I guess from, 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 from the hosting perspective, we'd probably be interested in being able to archive that and remove it from the servers, but yeah, that just kind of Well, we'd also be interested from the library's perspective. Right. I mean, yeah. and that's, and that, that's where I was headed with your presentation this morning. Just to see if I, first thing I did was email two or three people on campus and ask, does anybody know Docker? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Mm -hmm. You had a question? 
So I'm really interested to hear how the media consultancy program is going. And it's exciting that you've got a group of five rising sophomores. Um, so what are you doing? What kinds of experiences and community are you creating among those students so that they're likely to stay uh, connected to that work so that you don't lose them over the next three years? Um. Uh, uh, want this question? No, um, no it's, it's kind of interesting actually because I think three of the five are kind of pals anyway, and two of them are quite technically inclined, and one of them actually has a part-time summer position with us remotely, and she is going to be our R&R and our studio student. So she's getting good. We have a, a minor in data science, and we always have these students coming and saying, Hey, you know, I need to do some R stuff, and we don't have, well, we don't have the bandwidth, so we haven't had the bandwidth just because we've been down a couple of people on our team, blah, blah, blah. But um, now we're going to have, we have a student who um, I'm kind of helping her um, find a path to help other, to guide other students as she learns her path as well. Um, we have monthly meetings, we have a Slack channel. Um, I think the Slack channel is pretty cool because like basically, let's say um, Adele has a shift tonight that she can't make, she just jumps on the Slack channel and says, hey everyone, someone take my shift tonight, that kind of thing. So there's like a kind of, you know, we're all in this together kind of thing. Um, ultimately they see it, I think, um, all of the ones who have been hired that I know of, they're like, basically I get, I get paid to learn stuff. Mm -hmm. I get paid to learn these great skills that I'm going to be able to use when I leave the college. And so, I, I mean, uh, I, yeah, we need to be more, uh, I need to be more persistent. I'm taking over managing the next coming semester. Mm -hmm. um, so I need to be more persistent about reaching out and whatever. But a lot of it is just individual Slack questions and stuff in the back channel or to the channel. I try to post there a few times a week. I tell them if they ever have any questions, no matter what time it is or whatever, they can always ask me on Slack and I answer from the beach, from wherever I am in the world, I, I try to get back to them as soon as I can. So. Also, I, I find working with other students really fulfilling, especially on like the class projects that I digitally map and help them. Um, so those are just some new friendships that have come from that and um, some good work. Yeah, it sounds like you all have space to lead as well, and so it sounds yeah. like you're empowering. Right. Yeah, ultimately, yeah. I hope that, like, Adele takes over the whole thing in a couple of years, the next couple of years. She doesn't know that yet. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how that goes. No, there's definitely a lot of space for that, yeah. um, and hopefully, and we have a lot of Sounds like you all are doing a lot of work in the teaching and learning space, and you mentioned Moodle a couple times. Do you all support Moodle as well, or is that a separate? Part of we can talk about this after. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was going to be my question of like how, like, kind of like managing those relationships, because I know we have like something similar. Of there can be like a feeling of like stepping on each other's toes, and just kind of like I think there's like some work in. There's space for both of those things. I'm just curious, like, how you all have navigated that. Yeah, we're all on the same. Like, our instructional design team supports uh, both Moodle and Domain and stuff. Brian is a Moodle and the uh, uh, Domain's a Min. So, you know, it is a very, um, but yeah, the, it's, that's kind of, if you have more specific questions, we can talk about it after. But we do, I, I mostly try to push with Domain stuff just because it's open and the students actually learn more skills, I think, using, like, their own domain stuff, and they do like in Moodle, and Moodle is more like, you know, submit here, click button, yay, you know, whereas domains opens up a whole a bunch of other opportunities, so. But it's nice being, being the point person for both, so yeah. you can have those conversations about, like, what space do you want to be in, and why, and, and it's not one or the other, and one is better than, you know, we don't present right. it like that. Right. We don't present it like, this is what you can do here, this is what you can do here, this is what students have said. So if you really want to, if you really want to learn how Moodle runs, you can always install it on your domain. <laughs> 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 